All right, infinity pool. Here we go. This one, it was pretty much what the trailer was. Like that's pretty much what the movie was. With one unexpected twist, I guess you can say that they didn't really allude to in the trailer, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. Not really earth shattering in terms of what you don't see from the trailer, but right. there was one aspect of it where I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of that's kind of an interesting idea. Mm. But uh, what it a was, weird fucking it, movie. It was a weird movie. I thought it was gonna go weirder. Yeah. The concept is pretty cool. Guy and girl go to a resort. In some weird, in some Eastern weird, European beach-like location. I think they shot in Croatia or something, someplace like that. He's a writer, they're hanging out, he's trying to get inspiration. I actually came here looking for inspiration. <laughs> they meet another couple, and then they're hanging out with them, and then he ends up killing someone in an accident. <laughs> He gets arrested and they're like, oh, in this country, we just put you to death and you can get out of death by letting us clone you for like a lot of money and then we just execute the clone. Yes. And so, that's it. And then you find out, and this is what they don't explain in the trailer really, but there's a group of people in the movie that have been doing this. Yes. Like a whole group of these people that have been cloned and they're rich enough to afford. They just keep paying for it. The so they clone, go out and yeah. they like commit crimes just because they're having fun. Yes. And then they get arrested and they're like, oh, okay, here's some money, clone me and then execute my clone. And then they just go back out and do it again. Yeah. Rich people bad. Rich people bad, you yeah. pay some money, you're above the rules. Yes. And that's it. It's a cool concept, but when you actually dig into it, like the whole thing kind of falls apart, Absolutely. especially the cloning aspect. From the trailer, you kind of get a sense like, oh yeah, they're doing some weird cloning. And I was thinking like, okay, this is gonna be very cool because we're gonna focus on this. Mm -hmm. And they don't focus on it at all. It just becomes like- It's like an afterthought. It's an afterthought. It's just a plot device yeah. to make the point they were trying to make. First of all, they're in this like basically shithole country but this one resort is like where the country sort of yeah. makes their income. Yes. Like rich people go there, spend money, sure. and like that's like a big... Yeah, the compound yeah. surrounded by barbed wire. But it still feels very much like it's in present day. Yeah. And this shithole country just so happens to have like advanced cloning technology. Whatever, okay. fine, but like none of the main <laughs> characters seem impressed by this. No. It's just kind of like, and oh, you made a clone of me. Okay. Yeah. It's just like glossed over, like, well, we could execute you or you could just pay us like a ridiculous sum of money and we'll make a clone of you and then we just execute the clone. It's like, well, why don't I just pay you a ridiculous sum of money and we call it a day? Why do we have to do the whole clone business? Yeah, so, and then... so the plot has this element of if you kill someone, if you murder someone or you commit a crime against someone. Basically any crime. Any crime, that person that yeah. you wronged, either that person that you wronged or a family member of that person gets to kill you. Yeah. That's as like culture. as like part of their religious culture yes. or whatever, which they kind of they don't really get yes. that deep into it. They but kind of at, at one point in the film, when he teams up with the rest of the people that get cloned, there's not a family member of the people that they wrong there to kill them. They're just killed by the law enforcement that work the jail or right. Whatever. So it kind of makes the whole killing of the clone pointless because they're the only yeah. ones sitting there watching it. Clearly, this isn't a cheap process. Yeah. So you might as well just take their money, not even bother with the clones, and now you're in profit territory. Mm -hmm. But the first time when he actually commits vehicular manslaughter and he goes through this whole, given the choice of, do you want a clone or do you want us to just kill you? And he, you know, he picks the clone. They have the son of the man who was killed come in to stab yeah, him. Yeah, he's just a kid. But what was weird was they were forced to watch and they were forced not like behind like a two-way mirror so nobody could see them. There, they were literally yeah, sitting in the room. There are stairs in back of them for bystanders to watch this yeah, execution. Yeah, like, like bleachers or something. Yeah. <laughs> so they're sitting in the bleachers <laughs> watching an execution. Yeah, and so the kid knows that the pers the actual person that killed his father is was, in the room. Is weird. But he's okay with that and he's okay with just killing the clone. It seems like something you wouldn't want to tell the family like, no, this is the man that actually killed your dad. Go stab him now. When a guy who looks exactly like him is sitting in the back of the room. That was weird. It just, they were playing fast and loose with those. So yeah, it, it tries to be like one of those esoteric, weird, it's, it's, it's Cronenberg's son. So Cronenberg is doing his dad's thing sort of. 
coming up with this like really weird, bizarre storyline. It's almost like a dark fairy tale somewhat. Yeah. But it's, it's still a cool story. No, it's cool, it's but just... the problem is, is it still is based in reality, or they're at least trying to convince you that it's based in reality. Yeah. Yet there's this this like modern fairy tale sort of thing. They're able to be loose and fast with the rules, I think. Right. And that just, yeah, to they, me, did not. Whole, like they chose to not focus on the cloning aspect at all. Really, it's just something he goes through. It, and like then you it said, just becomes plot a plot device, device yeah. that these rich people use as a way to live outside the law. Yeah. Because they're rich. <laughs> Got it. Uh, we'll get more into that. Well, later yes. But that's that's the gist of it. And then they they spend the rest of the movie kind of just breaking the law and then getting clones made of them that they're paying for and then the clones just get executed and then they keep living like this. And James Skarsgård, the writer, he's kind of like in a daze the whole movie. Like yeah. you can't really get a fix on like where his mind is at. This was my biggest issue with the entire film was his character. Same. He didn't have like the proper motivations to be doing things the way he was doing them. Like yeah. he, he comes to this resort with his super rich wife <laughs> and he Long is, later. he wrote like a book a few years ago. I think it was like six, six years, years ago. Yeah. And now he's he's trapped. He's, he's got writer's block. He needs inspiration. So they came to this resort so he can kind of get his head straight. He doesn't really come off as a person, like a troubled person. He like, he dresses well, he, you know, he looks good. He just he's seems like a he, normal He just dude. seems like a normal guy. Like he's not acting like the way you would expect him to act. Like yeah. he's acting kind of confident. And then when, when the whole accident goes down and then they're forced to watch, he kind of like starts like smiling, watching himself die while his wife is just like completely disgusted by it. it that felt kind of unearned. Like his character, I would expect that from a writer who was maybe like more self-loathing, who would take pleasure in seeing harm come to themselves because maybe he was like suicidal or something. And they just didn't do any of that. Yeah. So his entire character's motivations just felt really weird. Yeah, uh, I'm this. I'm with you. Uh, yeah. I feel like he is the biggest problem with the movie, and it's not necessarily a performance thing. I no, think that he was good. I think that Alexander Skarsgård is actually a very good actor. I don't think he was the right one for this role, and the reason why is Al Alexander Skarsgård is like the picturesque model of Alpha Ch Giga Chad. He's what you, know you what call I mean? a specimen. Six foot five, <laughs> yeah. six pack abs, yeah. whatever. And he's when they like, take his shirt off, he's like cut yeah, too. He, and yeah, it's like, okay, exactly. But he's, care of himself. he's supposed to play this guy who's like pathetic and self-loathing internally. We don't yeah. get that at first. Yeah. The first instance where you kind of see that, I think, is when he gets arrested for the crime. And he's sort oh, of... He just he, he kind of Yeah, up. he yeah. kind of like loses it and becomes like a little bitch sort of. What? What you say? Yeah. Which is partially understandable I, because he's in a foreign land, he's scared. Yes. And like this I is, didn't I didn't really like hold that against him because you're no, like your whole same. life is upside down now. You're being accused of murder. Same, but I think that's and, what they were trying to do is show like yeah. he's actually very But that was weak. a weird way that was a weird time to show it. Yeah. Because most people would probably freak out in that scenario. One hundred percent, yeah. They wouldn't be like all alpha chad in that moment. You'd be like, holy but shit. But that's what I'm saying though. Like when you cast him, you see a leading man in the main character role you think that he's just going to be sort of like confident. You know what right. I mean? He's got an air of confidence about himself. Yeah. And I think when the movie first started, he kind of comes across that way, perhaps. Yeah, when they're like, yeah. they're having lunch and she's yeah. like, oh, I want to go try this restaurant in town. He's like, so go try it. Yeah, exactly. Like, he, I mean, doesn't, he didn't come off like, oh, yes, of course, whatever you want. No, like, but at the same time, I didn't get any nerdy, self-loathing writer vibes mm -hmm. from him. He just seemed like a normal dude. Yeah. But... Again, they cast this dude who's like the picturesque alpha male. And I don't know if that's like Brandon Cronenberg saying that like the alpha <laughs> chad is really this like... Underneath with, every alpha yeah, chad is a beta cuck. Exactly. Because yeah. he turns into a total beta and like doesn't stand up for himself. He's just emotionally weak. Yeah. He's impressionable. Oh my God. He basically just sits down. And he's like, what do you want me to do, everybody? Exactly. And like, and until they, the very end have, when he kind of grows a but pair. He, but when he grows a pair, he's like... And then I don't want to see more. Fuck you. It lasts for like eight seconds. Yeah. He grows a pair. It lasts for eight seconds, and then he's right back to being what he was. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, but it just—it definitely felt like we're gonna cast someone who's the ideal uh, alpha male. 
and we're gonna show that inside they're really a pathetic sack of shit. Now, speaking of alpha males, the character that really carried the movie was Mia Goth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who was more of an alpha yeah. in every sense. Mia Goth is like the, the current A24 it girl. Yep. But she really was good in this. I, like, I She was my favorite part of this movie. So I think that her sort of breakout, even though she's been in movies before this, but was X. That's sort of where they started promoting and really pushing mm -hmm. her. Yeah, I remember she was in... I think she was in Suspiria too, like the remake of yeah, that. Yeah, I, like, I haven't seen that, but. Yeah. And I didn't like X and I didn't really like her in it. She was annoying in that movie, but it kind of annoys me that she's like the indie darling right now. Mm -hmm. um, but she was actually really good in this. I liked it. She she definitely like hams it up. Yeah. Like but an it, over the top role. But, but in like a perfect way. Yes, she plays it very well. Yeah. She's got good range. She does. What she doesn't have are fucking eyebrows. Our eyebrows in this movie. She needs like a, just a pencil, just a thin line would have given it a little definition, then I wouldn't have been staring above her eyes the whole time. I just it was just stop weird. Looking. Yeah. It was just weird. Like Apparently she had a burn this victim or something? I don't, I don't. What the fuck happened? It was this is a trend going on right now. Yeah. So I started thinking like, is she like that in all her movies? Maybe she just has thin eyebrows. But this one in particular, they're like non existent. None. And it was kind of distracting. It's fucking distracting. She's just one of those chicks that you can't is she hot or is she not? I don't know. I go back and forth with her. Yeah, even though there's no eyebrows in this, I still feel like this is the hottest she's looked in a probably. movie. Probably. <laughs> if she had them, <laughs> she had she'd them. probably be hotter. Yeah. You know, I wonder why. I don't know. Yeah. So one thing this movie has going for it is stylistically, aesthetically. Yes. It's very, very good looking very movie. nice looking movie. Yeah. Brandon Cronenberg also directed Possessor which I think you and I also kind of feel similar on. There are also a good stylistically good, but I, I, not as good as this. No, in no, my but opinion. Possessor is still a very nice looking movie. Yes. He knows how to shoot a film. Yes. I think that Brandon Cronenberg is first and foremost really good at tone and just like capturing like the most fucked up nihilism possible. <laughs> but I think yeah. he struggles with the storytelling department. His stories tend to feel very surface level. Like there is a story, but it's hard to kind of connect with anybody. Yeah. Because generally all the people in his films are just assholes. Er, all, so every it's like, character, who am I much. really with? Like, like with Possessor, it was just like, I was never really with anybody in their struggle because everyone's an asshole. Yeah. And then with this one, it's like, yeah, I guess you're like kind of supposed to be along on this ride with James, with Skarsgård, but he kind of sucks too. You're along the ride with him, but He's just not interesting. Right, you're and, not you're not connecting to him. Yeah, and as it goes on, you sort of detach from him even more because you realize what the why is he like, like what a little is he, bitch? He's, he's like a bitch. Yeah, right. Like as you get towards the third act of the film, when he he's like running away from the group and he gets shot and he like hits the ground in the woods and he's like oh and he's his leg and he gets up and it's like I didn't care and that's not good. No. Like I should have cared more that this guy we've been following the whole time is now injured, could be mortally wounded. Like we don't know yet. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I guess that's just where we're going. And something that I noticed very early in the film, like with the music choices, Cronenberg did a great job of using music during these daytime resort sequences mm -hmm. to make it feel very ominous. Yeah. And that had, had a lot to do with the music and also some of the camera work. Mm -hmm. And that just set the tone. He has that. He knows yes. how to do that really he well. He knows how to set a tone. He knows how to direct really well. There was one shot that I absolutely loved in the movie. When he gets arrested for the first time and he's in that room and the, the police guy comes in and he's talking to him. And he's talking to the police guy in front of the window and then he walks into the foreground and sits down and the focus stays on him. But the guy in the background's talking and he's completely out of focus, but the light from the window's wrapping around him. Oh, that's right, yeah. And it makes him look like this like weird alien yeah. creature in the back and he's talking yeah. the whole time. And it was just like, that was such a great shot. So like that, all of that was there. Mm -hmm. So like Possessor, <laughs> there's a lot of weird acid trip, surreal imagery in it. Yeah. Which from a technical standpoint looks cool, but it did. It did look pretty cool. <laughs> but you keep I watching. Thought it, I thought it looked cooler in this than it did in Possessor. It did. Possessor has a lot of like him sort of testing the waters with things and him kind of perfecting it with this movie. Yes. Trippy mindfuck sequences right. are part of that. Trippy orgy sequences. Yeah, like kind of what I was saying earlier about it being like a fucked up fairy tale. I guess what what I mean by that is it's like a it's a surreal tale. Like, you know, there's one part where he walks into the lobby or whatever, and then mm. we just see this random shot of these rabbis sitting there. <laughs> and like, they're just sitting there, they're in full rabbi garb, and they've got like these huge <laughs> fucking noses. 
<laughs> it was just one shot. Literally and one shot. Like he, and it lasts like, like three seconds. Wait, what the fuck? And then we're, we're, we're on to something else. Yeah, and I don't think he was even tripping in that scene. No, he, that was, he that. was leaving, I think, at that point. Yeah. He had been on like drugs like on and off the whole movie. Like Mia Goth kept giving him like this bowl with like... That root in it. That some root on that they, they don't explain. In what the smoke. It, yeah, and it's just like... Yeah. Okay. But he's, he's on that stuff. Yeah. And then he has these weird, trippy orgy scenes. <laughs> It starts off with just Mia Goth. Yeah, first. it starts off with Mia, Mia Goth, and then suddenly it all of the over. all of the other <laughs> pans there's, over. There's Albin, just Albin beating, beating off. at the base of the bed, <laughs> like, smiling. The and then then the whole cast of the uh, cloning misfits are there. Yeah, the rich cloning misfits <laughs> just having their like debauchery. Yeah. Orgies left are they and right. There or are they not? Yeah. I don't I, know. Yeah. Strobe lights going. And they start blue doing that, lighting. that weird oh. sh- like nipple umbilical cord shit. Yeah, there's like. nipples there, and they turn into like umbilical cords. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know what? It's a trippy drug sequence. Like you, that stuff. Whatever. It's, it's fucking weird, it's bizarre, fucking and gross. Weird, but but it works. what do you expect from a David Cronenberg? Cronenberg son, right. Yeah. Exactly. And another like weird piece of imagery were the masks that they're wearing. They're each of them wearing those weird kind of, I think they said they were like some kind of religious tribal masks, something from that island. But the hotel just has them in the gift shop. The hotel just sells them in the gift shop. <laughs> so they have them, but I, I kind of like the way they look. They reminded me of like a, like a homunculus type. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mask that were all distorted. And it's like, they bring this up at one point where the, one of the guys, one of the rich guys, mentions like, well, how do you know like when they clone us that we're not actually the clone and they're just killing the real person? Yeah. Which if you think about it, makes no sense considering how the plot works out. There's like no benefit to switching them. No, at all. there is no benefit. But I think but, that I think that when you first get introduced to the process, you're thinking you, about you do it. think about yeah, that. So I'm it's like they, they addressed they it. They knew that the audience was going to be thinking about right. it. So they, they addressed, addressed it and yeah. they immediately like pushed that aside. Yeah. But it had me thinking of like the whole cloning process and how he says, you know, normally we don't get it right on the first try. Normally it takes two or three tries and it's like, well, what do you do with the other ones that don't... Probably deleted scene with the uh Well, the like, so, so if you have a messed up clone, is it still alive? Do you use it for something else? And that's what started making me think of like the homunculus, like with the oh, warped yeah. mask and yeah. everything. And it's like, are those clones still out there or do you just scrap them and start fresh? Right, yeah. Or do you, you know, try to salvage like, well, this one, you know, he's got two left feet. Do we still keep them? Or like, you don't know how fucked up they really are. The mask they, definitely did give off a vibe of like a fucked up cloning experiment. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Which was kind of cool. But it then was they- Very unique and cool design. It was. I did like the masks. But I would have also liked to have known a little more about the whole cloning thing. And the fact that he mentioned like, you know, we got you right on the first try. You're normally- most times we don't get it right. And they kind of like brushed over that. And it was well, like, okay. Uh, like the whole cloning process in general, they just yeah, brushed over. Yeah, they just over brushed it. over because I guess it's not really like that important, but, but it be, kind of is an important aspect is. of your story. It just piques your curiosity. And so unfortunately, I know that they wanted that to just be a plot device, but unfortunately it's just such a, a huge concept that you can't help but think about all the other ramifications right. that come out Especially of it. the process itself, where it's like, strip you down, put this big thing in your mouth and just, put you in some goo and then flash some lights at you. And they it's put like, you in a shitty bathtub with this goo. <laughs> put you in a Turkish bathhouse. They pump in some red goo, then they mix in some blue ink, do some strobe lights at you, and now there's a clone of you. And it's like, obviously, no thought went into that because it's irrelevant. The cloning <laughs> doesn't matter at all in this movie. It's just a plot device. So it's like, it could be literally whatever you want. He walks into a room, you close the door, open the door, he comes out and it's like, oh, look, technology. Why did you try using this technology out in the world to make some money for your country instead of just having rich people pay you to make yeah. clones. You can sell it's, the it's patent like, to it and like make billions, <laughs> right? you can make trillions now, of dollars. It, it like a movie where cloning technology was actually used with a purpose for monetary reasons, for all kinds of different reasons was, was Moon with yeah. Sam Rockwell, where it's way cheaper to just send a new clone up there than to bring this guy home every time. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. The cloning in this movie just served no purpose other than just a weird thing. Yeah, it would be interesting to see the same concept, but in the hands of a different filmmaker. Like another filmmaker that's more seasoned. into... <laughs> yeah, that's more seasoned. seasoned at story that's just telling. good at telling like a narrative story <laughs> right. that goes from point Someone A to B to C. Someone who would look at Cronenberg's script and be like, oh my God, you got fucking holes everywhere. Yeah, here. exactly. <laughs> Someone who would fill in the holes. They would right. do something interesting with it. Would it be as esoteric? No. And no. 
tonally driven? Probably not. Yeah. But at least it would satisfy you probably on the story front. This is just a little game. You know, James, do you worry they got the wrong man? All right, so there's there's still other things to talk about with Skarsgård's wife and the group of rich people, but let's actually rate the film first, and then we'll get into that. Okay. I think we were pretty close on this one, too. Well, fucking right? shocker. Uh, <laughs> one day, it's going to happen. We're going to hard disagree. One day. Yeah, based on everything we were saying, some things that worked, some things that didn't. For me, that was, I ended up being 50-50 right in the middle, so I gave it a five out of 10. I guess I liked it slightly more than you. I would give it a 5.5. Oh my God. It's very slight. There were things about it that I enjoyed. I was along for the ride. Um, I was never bored. No, it was not boring at all. And I know that this is the point when you watch one of these movies, but it's just way too nihilistic for its own good. And that just like weighs down on you at the very end of it. And you're just kind of like, oh my God, these people are so fucked up. He's so pathetic. <laughs> I just don't care. And the payoff. It's it just like... it just weighs on you the whole movie. And I, I, I'm assuming that's the point. <laughs> yeah. But I had too many questions about the cloning. Mm-hmm. His character, there's just so it raised a lot of questions. None of them were answered, and that was just kind of leaves you wanting more. Not necessarily yeah. wanting more, but it leaves you just wondering things that you should know about. Yeah, and because of that, it makes it an unsatisfying experience. It was unsatisfying yeah. at the very end. Like while we were watching it, we we were entertained. There were certain characters that kept it engaging and moving, and then it ends, and you're just like, oh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. I wanted to like this a lot more. Yeah. It's worth seeing though. If you if you're in a it fucked is worth up seeing, mood, yeah. <laughs> go check it out if, if you want to okay watch something with, fucked with up. With Cronenberg. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there was some woke shit woven <sighs> deep into this film's <laughs> DNA. <laughs> <laughs> so we walked out of the movies, and then I think you said, "How many was it out of the movies that we've seen since we started so, this channel?" Yeah, we've only, at this recording, this is number 10, so f half, literally five out of 10 movies that we've seen so far have had interracial couples in the lead where whether it's a black person as the husband or a black person as the wife or boyfriend, and they are morally superior in every way, and then the white counterpart, husband or wife, is just an asshole, a loser, a piece of shit, scumbag. All of the above. All of the above. Whatever. <laughs> I remember thinking that like halfway through the movie, like, well, this is kind of like, like a trend that it's I've little, little, that started to notice. That <laughs> started to notice in the since we've been doing this, what three months now? Yeah, I mean it's in fucking commercials too. You watch a commercial <laughs> and there's like some dopey ass moron white guy, <laughs> and then there's like black wife who just looks at him like you're an asshole idiot fucking yeah. moron but yeah <laughs> literally going back looking at all the stuff it's it, yeah it's it's the pattern anyway for this this wasn't immune to that this was not immune to that <laughs> so now we have his wife his mixed race wife who's rich who's super rich he clearly married for money and she married him uh, to piss her her uh, monster parents off. Yeah, she right. flat out says that. I married him to piss off my dad. Yeah, yeah. Now, her character just... She's just there to be mortified at all these rich the, white people. She's the immune one. She's <laughs> the one rich person out of the group who's just immune to the horrors. So when they first witness Skarsgård, his clone dying, she's sitting there mortified, and Skarsgård's like... <laughs> Half smiling, half doesn't know how to feel, and then that they're sleeping that night, and she's like, "That was the most messed up thing. I can't believe you're actually like not more upset about this." He's like, mm. "It's really disgusting." <laughs> you could just sit there and watch it happen. And she's just above it all immediately. Immediately. And I mean, yeah, I guess most people would be like, "That's super fucked up. What we're watching is super messed up." But of course, he falls right in with the other group of rich people who are all like, yeah, isn't it great? Like, we just commit crimes. And then we get to watch ourselves die. And they're all white. 
They're all white. All of them. That one woman <laughs> was like maybe, she was like a really tan woman. I couldn't tell. She, she was a little tan. It was hard to tell. But she was still white though. And Albin, I think, what was he, French? Yeah, but I mean, kind of white. I don't know. I, he looked like a he looked like he'd be Spanish or something. It's, it's just it was. <laughs> there were a bunch so of elitist, rich white pricks that just can get away with anything because they're rich and white. Right. And Except her. Yeah. She was above it all, so she just leaves. And but she also has that one great line in the beginning when they're they're gonna go out into the countryside when they first meet Mia Goth and her husband, mm. have a little picnic, you know, and they're not supposed to go out. It's a dangerous right. country. They give a little exposition a little about the country. little exposition, and Skarsgård's like, yeah, come on, like, we should go with them, yeah. it'll be nice. And she's like, I don't know, there's like a lot of criminals out there in the countryside. It's not their fault, though. <laughs> it's like, just, have- just a throwaway line of like, yeah, it's not their fault that they're criminals. You know, they, she has to blame it away, knowing nothing about the situation. She knows nothing about this country, nothing about why these people are the way they are what the economic situation is. But she's she got just that, knows that if you're a criminal, you're, she's, you're she's, still- you're, She's got yeah. that morally yeah. superior- mm-hmm. Morally superior eight ball that she has in her pocket that tells her secret things that nobody else knows, yeah. right? Like the criminals that might attack you and kill you when you go out into the countryside. It's not their you know, fault. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's right. just the circumstances that they're in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing a criminal does is their fault. Got it. And then she kind of like just, She's like, I've had enough of this. She disappears. She goes back home halfway through the movie and then just leaves him there. And he's just now fully immersed in his little gang of rich white, uh, above the law. Elitist pricks. Elitist pricks. Yeah. And that group itself was just like, okay. We I got mean, it. they were a colorful group of people. Um, but not really. There should have <laughs> been. <laughs> You should have had an Asian guy in that group. Yeah. There should have been a black guy. There should have been like it should have been like a, a world I didn't, representation I didn't of see rich any people. diversity in there. There whatsoever. was no diversity yeah. in the casting of that rich group. They, you know, they really had an opportunity, but you know, listen, uh, there's got to be so white. there's got to be rich Asian people out there. There's got to be uh, rich Indian people. Well, I mean, according to the on. filmmakers, I guess not. I guess I only guess rich not. people could be super yeah. white. I guess so. Except the one who's morally superior. Yeah, but she, she was, was above it all. She was mixed race, and she said her dad was an asshole. Oh, so, he's so her probably dad was a probably white, white. guy. Right. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it just turned into this morality tale of rich people, rich white people, bad. Yeah. Class struggles. Rich people, rich white people are above the law. Yeah. And they can get away with whatever they want. It was just so on the nose with that. It was. That thematic idea was basically the backbone of the entire film. Yeah. Which leads me to my. Rainbow score. Mm. So I'm going to give this a three on the rainbow score. Yeah, that's where I am. Three. Fucking three a, rainbows. It could have been worse. Oh yeah, it could have been worse. The wife had her her lines in there here and there, yeah, and then she was she was, she gone. was fucking out of there. She though. was out of there. You know? She was too morally superior to hang around yeah. in that group. She left, and then it was just that underlying. Yeah rich group because the class thing was like the backbone of the film that just propels it to at least three rainbows yes. for me yes so all right other than that i mean it was an interesting film we enjoyed watching it it wasn't great but i guess we do recommend checking it out if I you're a Cronenberg fan yeah and i'm actually looking forward to seeing what he does next because i think yeah, that he does too. show a lot of promise his um, films have been getting better and better they have been his first one antiviral that one's a little rough. <laughs> Again, fucked up. You need to watch that one. I still haven't seen that one. <laughs> I've seen Possessor. Possessor was like, oh, it was almost there. Yeah, they, that, and that's the that's the running theme with all of his movies. Yeah. There are definitely cool concepts, cool visuals. He just needs to sort of work on the narrative department a little bit. As you said, he is getting better with each movie. So I am looking forward to seeing what he does next. Definitely. 